Hi everyone, this is Ryan here. My YouTube handle is Ambient, and I'd like to welcome you to my very first Chrono Series related video. I'm a big fan of the series as a whole, although Chrono Trigger is my favorite installment. I find myself often thinking about Chrono Series lore, and have wanted to make at least one video to share my thoughts. Compared to some other beloved series, the Chrono Series has only a small handful of official material to work with. There's Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, Radical Dreamers, and now Complex Dream, the Chrono Crossover event bundled with another Eden. Because of this lack of material, some fans have taken it upon themselves to create their own Chrono installment in the form of Chrono Trigger ROM hacks. Some of these exist to up the difficulty of the original game. Others add expansions to the main story, like the Shala edition. But some create completely new stories entirely. And this brings me to the video's main topic of interest, Prophet's Guile. Prophet's Guile is an unofficial, fan-made Chrono series installment that was made using a program called Temporal Flux, which is a ROM hacking tool that can be used to edit, alter, and manipulate the assets within the Chrono Trigger engine. This means that folks can use this program to create a game that looks and sounds like Chrono Trigger. Prophet's Guile was released in 2007 by Kajar Laboratories, who are a group of dedicated Chrono Series fans hailing from the Chrono Compendium fan website. I regard Chrono Compendium as the definitive fan website of the series because it's such a comprehensive trove of information regarding all things Chrono. Kajar Laboratories would go on to almost sort of release Crimson Echoes in 2009, which was a whole new Chrono Series story that would take place between Trigger and Cross. Unfortunately, production was halted at the 11th hour by a cease and desist order from Square Enix. But back to Prophet's Guile. As far as I know, one of the main intentions for its creation was to show off the capabilities of Temporal Flux to hopefully inspire other Chrono fans to create ROM hacks of their own. However, Prophet's Guile also existed to tell an untold story revolving around Magus. There are a few pronunciations of Magus, with another common one being Magus, but I've always gone with Magus. Hopefully that's not too much of a problem. Anyways, Prophet Skull tells the unseen trigger story of how Magus quickly gained the trust of Queen Zeal as the shadowy prophet, while Chrono and the gang had their second run through the prehistoric age. Now, before I get into the thick of things, let me briefly explain the nature of this video. I will be going through the entire plot of Prophet's Guile over an edited and shortened video of myself clearing the game. So major, major spoiler alert. I will also be touching upon strategies, here and there, for beating regular enemies and defeating bosses as they come up in the plot. So if you're wanting to play Prophet's Guile and figure out these strategies for yourself, I would suggest not watching this video. Lastly. I will be offering my own Chrono series theorizing and additional backstory alongside my plot commentary wherever I feel like it makes sense. For certain theory topics that require more extensive elaboration, those topics will be fully fleshed out after my plot commentary within what I like to call my appendix section. It's pretty academic I know, but it will allow for a smoother plot commentary that doesn't digress too much I hope. If you're looking to play Prophet Guile, it is imperative that you use the ZSNES emulator. If you don't use this emulator, a game stopping bug will occur midway through the game without any way around it. Not to mention that some of the in-game music will sound pretty glitchy, and not in a good way. I've provided a link in the description below to a ZSNES download that should work with the latest versions of Windows. So with all of that out of the way, let's get started. The opening screen of the game is a quote from Surge. Not the Surge from Chrono Cross, but from Radical Dreamers. Surge describes the appearance of a man named Magill, who some may recognize as the pseudonym that Magus goes by in Radical Dreamers. According to Masato Kato, director of Dreamers, Cross, and story planner of Trigger, Dreamers is not canon in the context of Cross and Trigger. Nonetheless, it offers an alternative perspective on the events of the series, 
and expands the lore in neat directions and what-ifs. Furthermore, Prophet's Guile's plot takes some of its cues from Radical Dreamers. I'm a big fan of this approach for several reasons, which I will get into later. The first scene of Prophet's Guile is a familiar trigger scene, which is the moment after the party defeats Magus at his castle. This is a huge moment in Trigger because even though the party was trying to defeat Magus, they may have ended up indirectly saving his life. It's believed that Magus originally summoned Lavos successfully, however, he perished upon trying to defeat him. This time around, the party interrupts Magus mid-summon. Upon Magus's defeat, he makes mention of the Mazamune, and seems thrown off by its greater power. He had been faced with the Mazamune before by Cyrus, yet it wasn't enough to defeat him. Why is that? I will greatly elaborate on this later, but in short, this could be due to either its refurbishment with fresh dreamstone, or the energy of Frog's will itself. Now, I've also wondered about a couple more aspects of this scene. Namely, how Magus was able to summon Lavos in the first place, and why a large time gate appears at this moment to kick off the next stage of the adventure. I have ideas on these points that will be fully fleshed out during the appendix of this video as well. In brief, I think that if Magus wasn't trained on summoning during his childhood in Zeal, he may have had an alternative access to the forest ruins located near Medina in 600 AD. The ruins were the remains of Zeal's northern palace. This palace is where elemental weaponry and related resources were locked up in Zeal after Lavos' energy was to become its primary source of power. This elemental paraphernalia may have also included ancient summoning tomes. In regards to the mysterious large time gate that appears, I think this is due to a combination of a few factors. Lavos' presence naturally creates a dimensional or gravitational warp around him, represented by the rippling blue waves often surrounding his body. Since Magus was interrupted mid-summon, this incomplete summon may have attempted to pull Lavos from a different time period. It's even possible that such a gravitational warp, even if not initially time travel based in nature, could refashion itself as a time gate if time travel apparatuses like the gate key or Marl's pendant are nearby. If we allow cop-out explanations that involve the Entity, we could say that the Entity interfered to remove Magus from this point in time. In the original timeline, Magus's disappearance de facto ended the Mystic War. This may be a happenstance that the Entity wanted to preserve. Finally, maybe a time gate did in fact appear here in the original timeline, which opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Ultimately, a slew of forces came into play to send the party off to the prehistoric ages for the second time, and Magus separately to antiquity. So we see that Magus has arrived exactly where Chrono and the gang will later arrive when they hit antiquity. He initially thinks he's in Magic Cave back in 600 AD, but he quickly pieces together that he's indeed back in his home time period. Moreover, he realizes he can try to do what he was doing moments ago, but to an even higher degree. He not only has another chance to defeat Lavos, but also a chance to undo everything that Lavos did to himself, Shala, and his kingdom in the first place. Exploring Zeal and Prophet's Guile, we can see the first new small location, the outside of Inhaza. This is also where we hear a slightly different version of Corridors of Time which you can currently hear playing in the background. It uses different instrumentation from the Chrono Trigger sound palette. Many of the classic tracks of the original game are reworked in this similar fashion. I really like these different versions. It's a great way to combine familiarity with the sensation of experiencing something new. Looking through Magus' inventory, we see all of the equipment he will ever be using in this adventure. This game is so short that equipment upgrades would be pretty unnecessary. In Anhaza, we see a Zealian make mention of the Northern Palace, which I had touched upon previously. 
One thing this game doesn't do is allow Magus to visit this palace, even from the outside. It could have been cool to see folks guarding the palace, or perhaps bringing some last items inside. Even better would be if we saw Gaspar or Balthazar covertly taking things from the palace for their own purposes. After all, Balthazar has powerful equipment waiting for the party in 600 AD at the main entrance of the forest ruins. It would be neat to see him setting this into motion. It would also give Magus more ammo to use against the gurus to help himself gain favor as the prophet.